and welcome to First Baptist Church Divine. I am Carlos Garduño. It is a pleasure to have you join us for worship. If you are visiting for the first time or you are a returning guest, welcome to worship. We are so happy you're with us this morning, whether in person or online. Would you do me a favor? In front of you, there is a yellow slip that you may fill out with all the information about you and your family and those that invited you. This is a way for us to provide spiritual care to you and just to say thank you in a more personal way for joining us for worship. On the church app for First Baptist Church Divine, you may also go to the visiting tab and give us the information for your visit today. If you are joining us online, you may do so by going to the website or also to the church app. Our goal is to be there for you and provide the best possible spiritual care as we walk with you to lead you to Christ through the gospel. To support the ministry here at First Baptist, we encourage you to do so in, the, in one of the next three ways. The church app has a safe and secure way for you to do one-time or recurring giving. One-time setup, it rem and you can control how that works as well. You may also do so by reaching in front of you and getting a white envelope that has the availability for you to put your check or cash and then filling out your information. You will find the offering boxes to deposit those in the back of the sanctuary near the exits or also in the foyer near the exits. If you are away from Divine and you are part of our church family, you may send offerings via mail. You can address them to First Baptist Divine, sending it to P.O. Box 468, Divine, Texas, 78016. At First Baptist Divine, we are committed to equipping all generations to impact lives for Christ. We have two services, 8.30 and 11 a.m. I encourage you to pray about those who attend the 11 o'clock service to make a missionary move to the 8.30 a.m. service. We ask this so that we may have more room for the guests that are accustomed to going to church at the usual time of 11 a.m. We have the same style of worship and you will hear the same message. I encourage you to stay connected with First Baptist Church by visiting our website, going to our church app, or simply by reaching out to the church office regarding meetings, resources, and the ways that we as a pastoral team can serve you. Welcome to worship with First Baptist Church Divine. Joy will 
joy, 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 making me whole though I'm broken. I am running into your arms of love, into your arms. Good morning, church. This morning we have the great privilege of beginning our worship here in the waters of the baptistry. In a few moments, we'll welcome Brother Stephen to make his faith and profession known. But as we do, we come this morning turning to scripture. I want to share with you about a brother named Philip who had been going around preaching about our Lord, who encountered a Ethiopian man who asked, what, is, what do these scriptures mean? And upon the explanation, the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down to the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So this morning we come to baptize Brother Stephen Vasquez. And as he comes, we invite his family to stand. Brother Stephen, I have one question for you. Who is your Lord? Jesus. Well, Stephen, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father who sent his Son, in the name of the Son who died for you, in the name of the Spirit who lives within you. Filled, what keeps you from professing faith in our Lord, Brother Scott? Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to do a responsive reading before we start singing this morning, just to get us in the right mood, the right mode. Let's go ahead. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers. From the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. For the Lord loves justice and will not abandon his faithful ones. They are kept safe forever. His faithfulness endures through all generations. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. How long? Forever and forever. Let's sing together. Give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand. His love endures forever, for the life has been reborn. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. 
He is with us forever. His love endures forever. He is always with us, always to guide us. Let's sing praises to his name this morning. I sing praises to your name. You probably know the chorus, probably, you might not know the verses, but we're going to do it anyway. The family of God, we're all here present in the same place, worshiping the same God, we are in His family. Let's sing together. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God, I've been washed in the fountain. Cleansed by his blood, join us with Jesus as we travel this God. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. You will notice we say brother and sister. folks are so dear. With one has a heartache, we will all share the tears and rejoice in each victory for this family so dear. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the Father, we do want to thank you for bringing us into the family of God, your family, the family that all we had to do was accept Christ as our Savior, to realize that the blood that Jesus shed on the cross covers our sins, to be baptized, just like we saw Stephen do. That's all we got to do. So, Father, 
We love you and we thank you for providing a way, providing the way, letting us be in your family. God, we thank you so much. In your holy name we pray. Amen. I stand amazed at the presence. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned the queen. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall end. to be here this morning. Good to see y'all. Uh, I've got a few uh, requests I'd like to bring up. Of course, we're all thinking on school. School starts. Some, some high schools are, have already hit the road running and ours are start soon. Uh, kids are off to college. I can call them kids. I'm old enough, right? They're off to college and seeking a new way of life and uh, new experiences. We want to pray for them as they start off a, a new year. Uh, also, I'd like to mention uh, Gary Neal is having a procedure tomorrow morning. We want to pray that God is in every aspect of that and, and that that will be a successful procedure tomorrow morning. Uh, I'd like to mention also evangelism training in Pretoria, South Africa. They're, they're starting to try to train up uh, leaders over there and people to out and go and, and reach out. Uh, also, there's an unreached people group in Timor Leste that uh, some uh, missionaries are trying to get together and get to this uh, remote place uh, and start some work amongst those people. Would you go to the Lord in prayer? Father, I just thank you for your presence, your love for us. We lift up to you, Gary, and his procedure tomorrow, Lord. May that be successful and the outcome uh, a positive thing. Lord, we pray for our students, whether they're in elementary, high school, off to college, grad school, wherever they're going, Lord, that that you'll be with them, and Lord, that they'll seek you and, and walk beside you uh, in every aspect of their lives and their learning. Lord, we lift up to you the, the evangelism training that is, is being planned for Pretoria, South Africa. Lord, that, that they'll reach many, many people in that part of the world, and people will spread the gospel as you have asked us to do. And Lord, those unreached people in Timor-Leste, Lord, uh, I pray for those that will go into areas that haven't been uh, 
reached before by uh, missionaries, Lord, that you'll give them courage, strength, endurance, and, and the words to say to reach those people there. Lord, be with us as we go into our world, Lord, our everyday world, and uh, help us to recognize the opportunities that we have to be evangelists, to reach out into every corner of this world. Lord, we just pray you'll watch over us, give us wisdom and discernment, Lord, as we go about your work, and may your, your name be praised here today and throughout our week. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning. Would you please stand for the reading of the word? If you have a Bible, would you please turn to Matthew chapter 4. Today I'm reading out of the English Standard Version, verses 1 through 11. The word of the Lord reads as follows. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, It is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. This is the word of God for his people today. Remain standing for worship. Hymn number 101 is how deep the Father's love for us. How deep the Father's love for us. Yeah. 
please be seated. of your life and I surrender all to you all to you and I surrender all to you all to you Singing youth this song, waiting at the cross, all the world holds dear, count it all loss, sake of knowing you, glory of your name, to know the lasting joy, even sharing in your pain, and I. Good morning to you each. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 36. 
This morning I will be reading from the entire chapter. If you have need for a Bible, there is one at either end of the pew that you are in, or there will be a visual aid overhead as I read. Beginning in verse 1. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations from the day I spoke to you, from the days of Josiah until today. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the disaster that I intend to do to them so that everyone may turn from his evil way and that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. And Jeremiah called Barak the son of Neriah. And Barak wrote on a scroll at the dictation of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord that he had spoken to him. And Jeremiah ordered Barak, saying, I am banned from going to the house of the Lord, so you are to go. And on a day of fasting and the hearing of all the people in the Lord's house, you shall read the words of the Lord from a scroll that you have written at my dictation. You shall read them also in the hearing of all the men of Judah who come out of their cities. It may be that their plea for mercy will come before the Lord and that everyone will turn from his evil way. For great is the anger and wrath that the Lord has pronounced against this people. And Barak the son of Neriah did all that Jeremiah the prophet ordered him about reading from the scroll the words of the Lord in the, ho- in the Lord's house. In the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, in the ninth month, all the people in Jerusalem and all the people who came from the cities of Judah to Jerusalem proclaimed a fast before the Lord. Then, in the hearing of all the people, Barak read the words of Jeremiah from the scroll in the house of the Lord, in the chamber of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the secretary, which was in the upper court, at the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. When Micaiah, the son of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, heard all the words of the Lord from the scroll, he went down to the king's house, into the secretary's chamber, and all of the officials were sitting there. Elishama, the secretary, Deliah, the son of Shemaiah, Elnathan, the son of Akbor, Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, Zedekiah, the son of Hananiah, and all the officials. And Micaiah told them all the words that he had heard when Barak read the scroll in the hearing of the people. Then all the officials sent to Jehudai, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Cushai, to say to Barak, Take in your hand the scroll that you read in the hearing of the people, and come. So Barak, the son of Neriah, took the scroll in his hand and came to them. And they said to him, Sit down and read it. So Barak read it to them. When they heard all the words, they turned one, turned one to another in fear. And they said to Barak, We must report all these words to the king. And they asked Barak, Tell us, please, how did you write all these words? Was it at his dictation? And Barak answered them, He dictated all these words to me while I wrote them with ink on the scroll. And the official said to Barak, Go and hide you and Jeremiah and let no one know where you are. So they went into the court to the king, having put the scroll in the chamber of Elishama the secretary, and they reported all the words to the king. And the king sent Jehudai to get the scroll, and they took it from the chamber of Elishama the secretary. And Jehudai read it to the king and all the officials who stood beside the king. It was the ninth month, and the king was sitting in the winter house, and there was a fire burning in the fire pot before him. As Jehudai read three or four columns, the king would cut them off with a knife and throw them into the fire in the fire pot until the entire scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the fire pot. Yet neither the king nor any of his servants who heard all the words was afraid, nor did they tear their garments. Even when Elnathan and Deliah and Gemariah urged the king not to burn the scroll, he wouldn't listen to him. And the king commanded Jeremiel, the, the king's son, and Sariah, the son of Azrael, and Shelemiah, the son of Abdiel, Abdiel, to seize Barak and, this, and this, the secretary and Jeremiah the prophet. But the Lord hid them. Now after the king had burned the scroll with the words that Barak wrote at Jeremiah's dictation, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. 
take another scroll and write on it all the former words that were in the first scroll, which Jehoiakim, the, the king of Judah, has burned. And concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, you shall say, Thus says the Lord, You have burned this scroll, saying, Why have you written in it that the king of Babylon will certainly come and destroy this land, and will cut off from it man and beast? Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, You shall have none to sit on the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out to the heat by day and the frost by night. And I will punish him and his offspring and his servants for their iniquity. I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the people of Judah all the disaster that I have pronounced against them. But they would not hear. Then Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to Barak the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote on it at the dictation of Jeremiah all the words of the scroll that Jehoiakim king of Judah had burned in the fire. And many similar words were added to them. Well, this is the word of God for the people of God this morning. Yankee Doodle went to town, a riding on a pony. He stuck a feather in his cap, and he called it macaroni. Well, many of us are familiar with Yankee Doodle as it was introduced to us as a children's nursery rhyme only later to learn that it's a patriotic song with its roots in the American Revolution. Now, the forefathers of this nation were led to declare independence from England after the British crown had imposed a, a series of policies and taxes that the American colonies flat out rejected. The colonialists had desired a representative government so that the voice of the people could be heard and so to accomplish this, the American colonies declared their independence from England. And war soon broke out. And the war that was fought came because the British crown was not willing to give up control, neither willing to give up power over the colonies. But I think we all know how that turned out for them, right? Well, this isn't the first time that control and power were an issue for the people of England. About 250 years before the American Revolution, there was a religious war of sorts that was breaking out across all of Europe. For about 1,200 years, the Roman Catholic Church had exercised great control and power over the governments and societies in Europe. And in 1500s England, English-speaking people would enter churches and the entire Catholic Mass was conducted in Latin by the priest or the bishop who was presiding. I just wonder by a show of hands this morning, how many of you know Latin? Well, that's good because even though I'm a little rusty, I'm not going to try to conduct this service in that language this morning. And complicating matters was that the Roman Catholic Pope had also decreed that the, decreed that the only authorized language of the Bible was to be in Latin. So if you wanted to know what the Bible said... You had to go to a priest, and you had to assume that he was telling you what it actually says. Well, it's into that situation that there's a spirit-led man named William Tyndale. And Tyndale's life's work was to complete a translation of the New Testament in English. The Roman Catholic bishops, upon hearing about this in England, actually make it illegal to, to possess one of Tyndale's New Testaments. So in order to get it printed... Tyndale has to go to Germany, and he has to go to the Netherlands. And to get it back into England, there are smugglers who carry this to, across the channel. And in so doing, the smugglers bring it back into the country at the risk of their own lives and at the risk of the lives to whom would purchase these New Testaments. As it would turn out, most of Tyndale's English New Testaments were purchased and burned by those same Catholic bishops who had made them illegal. And Tyndale would go on, as he stayed in mainland Europe, to, to translate the Old Testament from Hebrew to English. But shortly thereafter, he was arrested, and he was tried as a heretic against the Catholic Church. He was convicted of his heresy. And he was sentenced to death by strangulation and burning, never knowing if his work would survive. Now, as it were, Tyndale's friend, a man named John Rogers, made 1,500 copies of the complete Bible, Old and New Testament, in English shortly after Tyndale's death. I would venture to guess this morning there may be 150, maybe 200 English Bibles in our presence, in our midst. If you were 
reading your Bible on your Bible app, you would have access to the Bible in hundreds, if not thousands, of languages. We have more access to the Bible in multiple translations than we can shake a stick at. We each owe a debt of gratitude to men like William Tyndale for their willingness to endure and to suffer for Christ. Now, for Tyndale, his life's work was the book that you have either in your lap or you've already shut and put beside you. A book that he gave his life, that that he did so gladly without any awareness that almost 500 years later, you and I would joyfully read through Jeremiah chapter 36 together this morning in English. And where I want us to focus our attention on for our next few minutes together is the Bible itself. I want us to seek to answer questions like, what is it? What's it for? What what are people like you and I to do with it? And what's God's concern with it? Because the Bible's perplexed men for, for a very long time. And from the external, it bears the appearance of any other book that we've picked up in our lifetimes. Yes, the Bible may be bigger or maybe thicker than the, many of the books you've read. It may have more words than many of the books you've read. It may have fewer pictures than many of the books you've read. But just upon an outward examination, it looks like any other book. But it's not until a person begins to read from the Bible that that one can begin to see that it is absolutely distinct from every other book known to man. And what I want us to first begin to see is that the Bible is a message that has been given, a message that has been given. And I think for most of us, we've had some sort of experience where we have found ourselves out in nature and we've just stood in awe of the scene that that we're taking in, that we're relishing in. And for me, those moments of great transcendence, they occur whenever I'm in remote areas where I can see the snow-capped mountaintops and the deep valleys in between, or when I look up into the night sky and I'm immersed in the wonder of what lays beyond the reach of the human race. Others may be overwhelmed by a sense of, of something or someone greater when they realize, uh, when, when they're taking in the ocean's beauty or the interconnectedness of deserts and, and rainforests and the life they're in. It's in those moments where we realize that none of what our eyes can see could have come about by chance, that there's just too much beauty and there's too much organization to, to it all that we conclude that there must have been a creator who's masterfully designed and creatively expressed himself in the course of bringing all things into existence. And this awareness of God through the wonder of creation itself is known as, as, as general revelation. That's what this is. And in other words, God reveals himself generally or to all through all known creation. Now, creation tells us something about God. But it doesn't tell us much. You take this lectern, for example, that I stand behind. It exists, obviously. It was designed and it was crafted into the handsome piece of furniture that it is. And we can answer many things about it just through observation. For example, we can answer the questions like how tall it is, how wide it is, how much it weighs. We can answer the question of the materials that it's made from. But we cannot answer through observation questions like, who built it? And for the sake of argument, if I were to tell you the name of the person who built it, there would remain even yet many more questions that we could not answer alone just through casual observation. Why was it built? What was the builder's desire with it? Or or questions of greater intrigue, what's the builder like? And it goes without saying that if we were to come to know anything about the builder, the builder would need to be the one who told us about himself. And apart from what the builder of, of this lectern would tell us, we'd have no knowledge of who he is or what he's like. And what makes the Bible unique from the lectern or any other book that you've read is who the author is. The Bible is God's special revelation, the means through which God reveals himself specifically to humankind. It's in the Bible that we learn who God is and what God is like and what his purposes are. 
And naturally, the question comes as we look at our, 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 our vision is cast down towards the Bibles in our laps. And we say, we ask questions like, you know, uh, Pastor Dan, I'm pretty sure a, a human publishing company uh, made the Bible that's in my hands. And beyond that, I flip through the pages I've been reading along this year, and I see that there's lots of books with headings and titles of names of men like this one that we're reading, Jeremiah. How can you, or are you really sure that this is from God? And the answer to that question, I, I answer you most confidently, yes. Whomever printed your Bibles, yes, they selected the covering. They selected the weight of the paper. They selected the size of the letters, and without any doubt, they charged you for every last bit of the selections that they made for the book you own. But when we, when we look at the introduction of this chapter, both concerns and curiosities are confronted as it has to do with the content of the Bible. Yes, the book is known as Jeremiah, a title that's given because of the human agent through whom this material comes. But make no bones about it. We've not read anything that originates from the mind of a man named Jeremiah who lived thousands of years ago. No, rather abruptly, we're introduced in the very first verse. This word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. And what word came to Jeremiah from the Lord? Take a scroll and write on it all the words that I, being the Lord, have spoken to you, Jeremiah. In this passage, it is God himself who is speaking to Israel, who's speaking to Judah, who's speaking to all the peoples of the world as he has influenced and inspired Jeremiah to write this message from heaven. A message from heaven that, as it turns out in this chapter, is a warning to all about their universal disobedience to God. And the message given in this chapter, it's a message that's given in mercy as we read in verse 3. So that it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the disaster that I intend to do to them. So that everyone may turn from his evil way and that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. We can see from this that out of the depth of God's unfailing love, the Lord mercifully is ready and willing and acting to call sinners back to himself. And God has influenced the writers of Scripture, like Jeremiah, to transmit God's own revelation of himself and his purposes in writing. And as we'll see in the New Testament about the Bible, that all Scripture is breathed out by God. The Bible, all 66 books, is the message of God that has been given to us by God. And because this is God's own word, it's a message that's to be heard. It's a message given and a message to be heard. And we refer to it in a number of ways. Scripture, the Bible, the Word of God. And what God inspired writers in the past to record was never meant to, to remain just as ink on paper. So when God says to write, it's so that in time it will be spoken so that it can be heard. There's three times in this chapter that what Jeremiah is uh, told to write is spoken so that it can be heard. And because Jeremiah has been banned from all the places of worship, the task of spreading the word of God is led to the, uh, left to the blessed one, Barak, who in verse 10, in the hearing of all the people, Barak read the words of Jeremiah from the scroll in the house of the Lord. And did that reading ever cause a stir among the religious types and the political types in Judah? They must have said to themselves, disaster? Disaster coming upon us? We're red-blooded Judahites. We're offspring of Abraham. What need have we to turn away from evil? We're God's chosen ones. There was a man named Micaiah who had heard all that Barak had proclaimed, and he proclaimed it as thus saith the Lord. And so Micaiah went to the officials of the king's cabinet, and he told them all that had been preached. And so they called Barak in to sit with him, and, and then once more the word of God was spoken. Repent or face God's judgment. And out of fear for what they had heard, they carried the message to the king, Jehoiakim, who upon his hearing of what God had instructed Jeremiah to write, simply cut the pages out and tossed them into the fire. 
And I'm going to come back to the ways that we can respond to the Word of God. But before I do, consider with me the great privilege it is to hear from God. For three distinct occasions in this text, there are words of such faithful warning that are mixed with God's patience and mercy. God had patiently instructed Jeremiah to write, and it's not for a full year before it's first read in the temple. God's message itself is one of mercy. Turn from your ways and return to me. God had chosen mercy over opening the floodgates of his wrath, which he could have done at a snap of his divine fingertips. Yet the privilege, yet with privilege comes responsibility because hearing the word of God demands a response. The king had been given a choice. Hear and your, and your soul shall live. Well, what are the proper responses to hearing the word, asks someone. Well, the first is this. Repent. Repent and surrender to the Lord and his ways. That is to turn from your wickedness and confess that you are a sinner, that you need a Savior, and Jesus alone is the only one who is mighty and able to save. And someone else asks, well, what else is there that I can do? And the answer, repent some more. Because, friends, the word of God, when it is proclaimed rightly, will always result in Jesus Christ lifted high and, and, and lifted up. And in the light of his glory and grace, we are shown the many ways in which we fail him, in which we need repent anew. And repentance is something that we're called to do both individually and collectively. You see, this message from God to Judah came in the face of, of terrible wickedness, yes, by individuals in Judah, but as well as across the land of the kingdom. And in the north, there was the Babylonian army that was amassing and strengthening, preparing to extinguish the people that God had established to be a light unto the nations. And friends, God has not only used pagan armies to render his judgment, He's used disasters in many forms to call his people to return to him. Friends, we look around today and there are fires in the west that are, that are just wrecking havoc. There are floods in the east that are absolutely devastating. And here there is drought without end. And we say to ourselves, well, that's because it's a fallen world, preacher. This is just what we live in. No. And we tell ourselves we needn't have worry. We're red-blooded Americans. We love God. It's, if there's a problem, it's with those people that vote that way or those people outside the church. Well, is that so? Tell me this then. Because here's something that don't ever make the news cycles at all. There are, right now in this state, there are more churches who are looking for pastors than there are men and women training in the ministry right now. Right now in this state, the majority of the men in the pastorate are in their 60s. And by the numbers, there are not younger men called by God who will be ready and able to take up the mantle that they leave behind. What does it say about the people who God is speaking to if he is unwilling to raise up preachers to proclaim the gospel? What does it say? Well, Peter later writes that judgment begins at the household of God, and since it does, we must repent for the ways in which we have become unsatisfied with Jesus alone. Not Jesus and something else. We must be satisfied with Jesus alone. You see, Scripture and circumstances are calling us to wake up. Scripture and circumstances are calling us to repent because in the droughts and the floods and the fires of our circumstances, the Lord is calling us to return and be satisfied in Him alone. And though the message can be given and it can be heard, it's also a message that can be rejected. It can be rejected. The third audience to the Word of God proclaimed is, is the king of Judah himself, Jehoiakim and his little inner circle that he kept around him. And when what Jeremiah was instructed to write had finally made its way to the king, it's, it's not the messenger, uh, Barak, who speaks it to him, but it's an underling of the king. And as that man read it, it, it says that as he completed each section of Scripture, 
the king would cut them off with a knife and throw them into the fire in the fire pot until the entire scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the fire pot. Well, that's pretty gutsy, isn't it? I mean, this is, the, this is God's own word, and we're just going to chop it up? We're going to burn it? Well, how is it that these folks could be so foolish as to do something like this? I'm glad you asked. Because God tells us in verse 24, Yet neither the king nor any of his servants who heard all these words was afraid, nor did they tear their garments. I'll tell you this. How someone understands and how someone interacts with God's word tells you everything about their relationship with the Lord. And moving beyond that, the decision to obey or ignore his word will impact one's life in profound ways. You see, I, if asked, I, I bet Jehoiakim would have claimed to have been a child of God. And in his mind, he was born a Jew. And he would inherit the special promise of God that was extended to those people. But obeying God? Oh, where would be the fun in that? He was king, right? And the temptation to live according to the truth that he had made up on his own caused the king to reject the only truth that there is, the very word of God. And in so doing, it caused him re to reject God himself. Well, I have the privilege of interacting with many people like you do. And there are a number of folks who are new to this community and when I speak to them, naturally the conversation flows to asking uh, how I can help them get situation in the, uh, situated in the community or, and how I can guide them to a church that proclaims the word through the teaching of the Bible. See, it's a very easy thing to do, do these days to find yourself in a church that has just an electric feel to it. Uh, to, the, the music is great by whatever standard of great to you you think great is. And the preacher stands up to declare to you the day's seven steps to joy in life or to lead everyone to do anything but give praise to the true and perfect King Jesus who went through the cross and went through the tomb so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And there's a danger for you and I, friends. And the danger comes from our hearts. Because our hearts are so inclined to run to whatever's easy or to whatever attracts. And when we've placed ourselves under the preaching of one who says more than or the one who says less than the very word of God, when we're responding to the moral and ethical challenges of our day with I, with I think rather than thus saith the Lord, we have found ourselves in the seat of Jehoiakim. We have found ourselves with our knives out, picking apart scripture. We have found ourselves rejecting the Lord. And with our knives, we may cut deep, we may chop, we may discard. But try as we may, no human effort can, can bring ruin upon the word of God because it endures forever. You see, another role was taken and upon it was written all the words of the scroll that Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire and many similar words were added to them. And if the call to return to God didn't carry enough weight on its own in that day, God's own resistance to the attempts to discard his word, they bring even greater force to the message. I mean, be honest, how many times do you have to be told no before you give up? I was thinking about this. I used to sell insurance right out of high school. And it was like two or three no's before I stopped trying to push some life insurance on you. But when maybe you're in love with somebody, how many more spurns will you push through in the hope that your persistence is going to change a mind? But in the reality of that, you know that that can only continue on for so long. Yet we, here we see that God will never lower his demands because of the hatred or the rejection of men. His nature of love forbids him from giving up. God's word is relentless because it is his word who shows us who he is. It's John who tells us towards the end of the New Testament, quite simply, God is love. And though we may try to reject or destroy the word, friends, we're never done with it. For it is the same word who will judge us. 
And tossing aside the thermometer does little to nothing to change the temperature of the air outside, as does rejecting the Word of God. Loved ones, the Word of God endures forever. And our attempts to take knives and pick it apart, they are vain efforts because really we're taking knives to a sword fight. And that's what John's trying to tell us in the grand opening of his, the, uh, the, the prologue of his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, John was led of the Spirit with bellowing voice to announce the Son of God, Christ Jesus, is the very Word of God. And though the, the Roman Catholic bishops in England tried to obscure the Word of God, the Word of God cannot be contained. Jehoiakim tried to pick it apart and burn it, but from the ashes the Word of God returned. And in the most dreadful attempt of all, humanity laid her guilt upon the Word. Humanity mocked the Word. Humanity tortured the Word, crucified the Word, and with great arrogance and pride tried to bury the Word permanently. But out of the tomb the Word arose. Friends, what lives forever cannot be destroyed. Well, what if, what if we took to heart the Word of God that, such that, that the Word of God died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for Him who for their sake died and was raised? Friends, if we did, we would see Jesus' kingdom breaking through among us. And as fragile a thing that that would be, how marvelous it would be to just for a moment see a glimmer of our king and his kingdom which comes quickly. Well, what's the big deal about the Bible? Friends, it's the very word of God. On every page we find the king of all, Lord Jesus, anticipated and announced and preached and explained and returning and there have been countless attempts to destroy the Word or to contain the Word. But what can contain the one who rolled away the immovable stone at the tomb? Who can lastingly destroy the one who has returned from the dead? What lives forever cannot be destroyed. And this is why I've asked us to read through the Bible together this year. And why I'm praying that you never stop. Loved ones, no matter where you are, join us in finishing the year strong reading the Bible. Pick up fresh today if, if you never started or if you've fallen behind. This single message isn't why. It's the gospel that's why. The Savior whose fingerprint is, on, is upon each page and in every word is why. The relentless love of God for you is why. The Word of God is the power to transform your mind, to grow you in the likeness of the Savior. It's the light in the darkness. It's the testimony to the unsurpassed depths to which God will go for you to be able to repent and to turn to Him. Would you surrender? Would you do as the Word of God commands you and I to do? I leave that to you as we pray. God, it's in your glory that we've come to make much of our Lord and to praise him. The very word of God who took on flesh, who lived a perfect and sinless life, who died a perfect death, having the sin of all time laid upon him and rose gloriously and triumphantly so that in his death we might live. God, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank you for your word. Lord, may the faithful proclamation and teaching of your word bring one more sinner from death into life this day. And God, as we leave from this place, may we be ready and able to proclaim the name of the one alone who was saved. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Church, Brother Scott's going to lead us in a hymn of invitation. As he does, please stand. This is your time to respond. This is your time 
to trust upon the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior if he's calling you today. This is your time to respond to the call if he's calling you to join this church in membership. This is your time to come before the altar and leave whatever burdens you hear in prayer. Whatever it is that the Spirit of the living God is calling you to do, we invite you, come and do that now. Holy Spirit, breathe on me until my heart is clean. Let sunshine fill its inmost court with not a cloud between. Church, if you'll remain standing for just a moment. I I threw y'all a curveball. Y'all were ready to sit. Brother Stephen, if you'll come. Looking upon the family that God has adopted you into as our brother, it's our great privilege to give you a copy of the Word of God. It will shine light into the darkness of your day, and you can use it as a lamp unto your feet. Uh, We're going to, as our benediction, uh, as we stand, we will recite together Brother Stephen's favorite verses, which comes from Proverbs chapter 3. Quite a selection, by the way, some of my favorites. So this will be our benediction, and we'll recite them together. And uh, upon the conclusion of that, if anyone would like to come and congratulate our brother, you can do that at that time. Let's say it together. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. God bless you each.